Hello and welcome to another edition of Conservation Conversations with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Melissa Howes Whitecross, and I'd like to welcome all of our viewers tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live tonight. As always, you can communicate with us through the Zoom chat room and ask your questions to our speaker throughout the webinar using the Q&A box or the comment feeds on the various platforms. And our speaker will get to these at the end of her webinar. You can use the hashtag conservation conversations if you'd like to engage with us on social media. And if you've missed out on any of our previous webinars, you can watch the recordings of these on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel or listen via the new podcast channel available on all major podcast streaming services. A big thank you to all of you who have continued to support the production of these webinars by donating through the Cricket Donations platform. All you have to do is scan that QR code you can see on the screen or visit the donations tab on our Conservation Conversations website. And please be sure to help us continue to bring you these talks and make sure that they are free for everyone to learn and enjoy. Make sure to enter our Jakarta Media Monthly Giveaway Competition via the Conservation Conversations website. But please remember that sadly, this competition is only open to our South African-based viewers. On the 30th of September, you can join me as we host the live virtual launch of the next Roberts book in partnership with Jakarta Media. Professor Nolene Turner, Temba Tembu, Sakamuzi Mklongo, and Junior Gabella, all community bird guides trained through BirdLife South Africa, will share the journey of creating the first comprehensive guide to birds of KwaZulu-Natal and their Zulu bird names. This promises to be a fascinating evening, and you can register for the event through the BirdLife South Africa birding events page on our website. And you can email conversations at birdlife.org.za to find out more. Next week, one lucky viewer tuned into Dale Wright's webinar will walk away with this exciting Zeiss hamper. All you have to do is just tune in for the full webinar and we will then contact you afterwards and let you know who has been able to win this amazing hamper. We'll be announcing the winner on the 29th of September as we have done in the previous months. Now, have you ever wanted to explore a big five area on two wheels and get to see the Bushveld's birds from your bicycle? Join me and the BirdLife South Africa team for our annual cycle in the Bushveld at Abelana Game Reserve from 5 to 8 November. Space is limited, so be sure to sign up soon. And for more information, you can contact Hirol Nayak at hirol.nayak at birdlife.org.za. Now joining me tonight is BirdLife South Africa's Christy Garland, manager of our Vakastrum Tourism and Education Center. This is Christy's second appearance on Conservation Conversations, and I must thank her for returning to the series to give us another exciting talk on something that is very close to my heart, getting the youth involved in this incredible birdwatching hobby of ours. Christy joined BirdLife South Africa 11 years ago and has represented the organization in Vakastrum on many different community and conservation projects ever since. If you've not had a chance to visit our Vakstrom Birding Center, I would highly recommend putting this on your birding destinations bucket list. And I would definitely recommend going out with our BirdLife Community Guide, who's based there, Lucky and Gwenya, to go and find some of those amazing grassland endemic birds on offer. It's also a really great place to find secretary birds, which was the topic of our webinar last week. And a big thank you to everyone who sent through records of the nests and sightings that you've been seeing. Now, Christy, I'm very, very excited to hear what you have to say to us this evening. So I'm going to hand over to you to share your screen. And we're really looking forward to hearing your talk tonight. Thanks so much. Hi, evening, everyone. Sorry, just give me two secs. There we go. Okay. Right. Thank you for joining us. And I was a little worried about how many people would tune in tonight, but I'm quite excited to have seen the numbers climbing as we get closer and closer to seven o'clock. So once again, thank you for joining. And I hope you do enjoy uh, this presentation tonight. Um, I'll go through a little bit about the lessons learned about starting junior bird clubs and the sort of activities that we use. And yeah, let's see if we can start up a couple of new junior bird clubs across the country. So we're going to dive in. Junior bird clubs, are they for us? And where do we really start with them? 
a little bit of background to what has been happening with Junior Bird Club, specifically from the Wackerstrom Centre. We support three clubs um, in Mpumalanga for the last four years. The first one is Country College, a school based in Forksrest. This is quite an interesting um, Junior Bird Club. We've got our junior juniors, our foundation phase learners, um, who meet once a week and we are um, doing various activities with them, a lot of play around the world of birds. And then straight after that, we normally have our senior learners come in for their um, weekly bird club meeting. Um, this is an extramural activity run by, well, at the school. And we have a total of about 80 learners across the juniors and the seniors uh, that participate on a weekly basis. Our second club is the Clay Edu Center. This is a after school program run by locals in the community. Um, and really the, the aim of this center is to give learners a place to go after school um, and get extra lessons. And we were contacted, as I said, four years ago to be involved with this program. The Junior Bird Club partners with another organization uh, in Wackerstrom called the Lit Alliance, and we run simultaneous programs with these learners. In total, we have about 120 learners that come through for this Junior Bird Club once a week. Our third club is the Smiley's Group. This is a little bit different. Um, this is a activity that is run for the local children on a Friday afternoon uh, with the aim of giving them something to do uh, besides roaming the streets um, and getting up to mischief. So we have about 90 kids that come through every Friday afternoon. We did find with this particular group that language became a bit of an issue. So about a year ago, we brought in Lucky and Gwenya, our resident bird guide, to assist with this club. So he really runs Smiley's on his own following the same sort of program as the previous two junior bird clubs. So just a little bit of what we've been doing. So what is a junior bird club? Like any other club, this is really a group of, a coordinated group of interested people that will get together and focus on relevant activities with a common goal or interest in mind. So in the case of junior bird clubs, really the common interest here is birds and birding and learning about the species and their habitat. And the goal, of course, would be able to, would be to be going out there and exploring and taking action for the conservation of these species. Very similar to how a normal um, adults bird club would run. What do junior bird clubs get up to? Obviously, they meet on a regular basis. They learn a little bit more about birds and habitats. Um, they're involved in hands-on experiences. So going out into the field, working with binoculars. And for many of them, it's the first time that they've ever held a pair of binoculars. And my biggest thing and, and what I really push for in our junior bird clubs is to take action for the improvement of natural spaces around us locally and working further afield as well as for the biodiversity found in these areas. How would you start a junior bird club? First step I would suggest is sharing your ideas in this group, be that a um, scouts group or a community group or even a school and including the teachers and learners in, in this discussion. Find out what they're interested in. It's not always what you want to achieve that, that builds the success of the Junior Bird Club, but more a combination of everybody's interests. And really, what do they want to achieve? Do they want to learn more about the birding environment and habitats and birds? Or do they really just want to get out there and explore? Get approval from all the relevant parties. This really is basically 
who is involved is if it's an after school program an extramural activity make sure that you involve the principal and possibly even the school governing bodies if it's off the school property make sure everybody is consenting to this and call it that introductory meeting things to cover at that first meeting discuss the goals of the club and the structure that you'd like the club to take whether you want to appoint different positions or portfolios within your club and make sure that everybody agrees to this. Um, also the meeting frequency, how often do they want to meet? A lot of the clubs, if they're linked to schools, meet on a weekly basis and community grouped clubs really meet once a month or every two weeks and discuss the length of your meetings. It's always good to give structure to your club and for the learners themselves. At least they can then plan how their days are going to run as well. Most of our club meetings are normally about an hour to an hour and a half long before the kids need to start catching transport back home. Another important aspect to discuss is where is your club going to meet? Is it going to be at the school front gates and you're going to work from there going out into the community or are you going to use the school property itself? Another important item to discuss are what are the themes that you may interact with during your meetings and the sort of activities that the learners want to be involved in. Here, obviously, they need a little bit more guidance. It can't always be fun and games. Um, so a mixture of activities is always a good one. Another item, would the kids like to go on outings? Um, this is always a little bit of a tricky one, especially with transport and, and things like that, but can be worked out with the group. What we found with one of our, our bird clubs, junior bird clubs, is that they prefer to go on outings at the end of the year. And they actually spend the entire year fundraising um, to cover the expenses of this, this camp that they go on at the end of the year. Do you want to involve guest speakers? This is always a nice one to, to get involved with, brings in a different aspect to your junior bird club and also gets the kids excited and shares the world of birds and opens it up really for everybody around. An important item is to discuss a catchy name and a logo. Have the kids involved with this, and this could potentially take up your first one or two meetings. This really gives the kids a sense of ownership to the Junior Bird Club and, and a sense of commitment. The overarching concepts of a Junior Bird Club and mixed with this environmental education. There have been research projects going into learners being out in nature, and it has been found that regular experiences with and in nature make children healthier, happier, and improve their curricular performance. We've definitely found this with many of our junior bird club members. Uh, a lot of them, and particularly in the natural sciences and the language uh, subjects, their performance has increased by 10 to 15% each year. Ensure there's an ultimate understanding of the positive role children can play in the natural world. I think for many, many reasons, we underestimate the value that children can play and the role that they can play in protecting and conserving our natural world. And ultimately, you are creating a lasting impact on children's scientific inquiry and curiosity. This is where it all starts, particularly with primary school children. This is the age at which they start deciding which lane and career they want to follow. It often reminds me of over the last 20 to 21 years that I've been involved with education, environment education that I keep bumping to children that I've worked with many years ago. And a lot of them have actually decided to take a career into either teaching with a focus on the environment or into scientific research. So planting that little seed way back when definitely comes into fruition later on. 
One of the big things with environment education and junior bird clubs is educating about the environment, educating in the environment, and educating for the environment. So it's that link that we start forming between knowledge and understanding um, to, of concepts and development of skills and competencies and the change in attitude that we can impact on. And this is all in connection with the curriculum. I think that's one thing that we can't leave out at all. So environment education outcomes and very much so our junior bird clubs looks at the environment in its totality, a holistic understanding and view of what's going on around us. It's a continuous lifelong process. And I'm sure we can all agree with this, that every day we are learning a little bit more about the world around us. One thing we need to consider is to discuss things at a local and contextualized level before moving on to and taking these concepts to a national, regional, regional and even international point of view. We need to ensure that we discuss the current and potential environmental situations with these learners. As I said, I think we, for many reasons, underestimate the value and role that children can play in planning and providing opportunities for making decisions and understanding and accepting the consequences. We really want to develop critical thinking and problem solving skills with these children, using a diverse learning environment and an array of different educational approaches. And this with a stress on practical and first hand experiences. And I think this is definitely where junior bow clubs fit in. So where do we start? We start with creating a love for the environment, which starts to affect children's attitude towards the environment, really getting down to that heartfelt sense. Once they understand something and well concepts and are able to have a love for it, there's an awareness that starts to grow and affects, starts affecting their decisions that they make. So the head area really. And with all this information, they're then able to use their hands and go out and take action for our environment. And that's really where we want to focus. It's all very well having an awareness of what's going on around us, but taking action is the more meaningful side of it. There's been a change in thought around environmental education and junior bird clubs. For a very long time, we really sat around being aware of things and taking action, but now we need to focus on being reflective of our, act of our actions, um, conceptualizing and making sense of these, and then being able to test our conclusions and decide on a plan of action. So really moving from just awareness and potentially affecting attitudes of children to a more um, definite area of being able to recognize concerns in our environment, assessing the value of our environment, particularly changing our behavior or children's behavior and encouraging them to take action and for change in our environment. And this is really this action and change of behavior is where our junior bird clubs find their place. So many people will often say, working with children is not for me. So let's take a look at the different age groups of children that we may come into contact with and think of your own children uh, as we go through this. Um, I think the hardest group of children to work for is definitely preschool children. They are curious little creatures, um, limited in terms of their communication skills and interpreting time and space have a little bit of difficulty in understanding different events and the, and the progress of these events, um, but really do enjoy pictures and art forms and other media. So that's really our sweet spot where we can get these sort of, these preschool children involved in environmental action. And really they do enjoy a hands-on approach with concrete experiences. So in order to work with these sort of 
this age group, we need to be flexible in our approach. And when I initially did my training two years ago, um, someone once said to me, always have plan A, but B, C, D, and E, and possibly even plan F in your back pocket. You never know what's going to happen. Um, and also then recognizing the learners, these preschool learners in terms of clarifying their role as people and the importance that they play. In terms of primary school children, and I think this is definitely the, the age group where we most have our effect, um, they still find it hard to concentrate for long, long periods. So one of the suggestions is don't talk for too long. Um, and I think many people who know me quite well will say, Christy, you, you need to curb your enthusiasm sometimes. Um, don't go on for too long. These primary school children are very active and have a zest for life and start developing special interests and hobbies at this age. They also begin to understand social requirements and responsibilities. So it's a good idea to start giving these learners responsibilities within your junior bird club meetings. One of the things, or some of the things to keep in mind is being friendly and humorous. Humor is always a great way to get children on your side and to get their attention, uh, be enthusiastic. And this is definitely the age group where you can be firmer with your group parameters. What do you expect from the group? If they need to complete an activity, they can really understand this sort of um, pro, uh, discussions and things. Secondary school children or high school children, always a diff difficult group to work with. They've got their own ideas um, and have set themselves up for, for something. <laughs> However, they can take initiative um, and work independently and really enjoy being set up for a challenge. Um, they're able to make predictions on, on activities. They can hypothesize and develop simple tests. They can also be involved in discussions positively and be able to start resolving issues. Um, they enjoy projects and gaining an experience in various things as well. To work with this group of children or young adults, you need to be able to set goals for them. They really like working towards something. Give them exposure, open the world to them and give them a stake in the project they really find this incredibly motivating. Encourage feelings of responsibility, promote choice and decision-making, and you'll be A for away with these children. So I'd like to take a little bit of a walk through linking activities to the curriculum. Um, and one of them is the idioms. We try as much as we possibly can to link all of our activities back to the curriculum. So I don't know if we can go on to the chat area, not right now. Um, but we, if you just think of some of the idioms um, linked to birds, and we've done some examples here. So as free as a bird, like a duck to water, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush, as scarce as hen's teeth, eagle eye, and as the crow flies. Now how we use these in a particular activity is specifically around a icebreaker. So just to get the kids a little bit loose um, and, and accepting of the progress or the program, is we go through a couple of these idioms and look at the explanation, what do they mean? Um, how do they link to our lives and to, to animals' lives? And then send them home with an activity to do with their parents um, and start looking at other sort of idioms that link to the environment and specifically to birds. Another interesting way to look at this as I said, as an icebreaker is to get families involved. So learners go home, having understood what idioms are, how they work, um, and start looking at different languages and how idioms are used in different languages. Um, so that's, that's a really fun activity to do. 
Another one that we really focus on junior bird clubs is starting the juniors right back at the basics. Many of them will know at least five to 10 local species of bird. So how we try and introduce the use of field guides as well as binoculars is we have cutouts of birds that we stick on sticks. And remember, many of these learners, it will be the first time that they ever hold a pair of binoculars. And you can only but imagine the chaos that erupts the minute they've got these binoculars. They're more looking at each other and what they're wearing through the binoculars than trying to focus on a little bird maybe in the tree. So using these pictures on these sticks, we're able to set them at different distances from the learners so that they're able to use their binoculars and focus on a still standing bird. Um, not only being able to look at the, the identifiable features on the birds, but also getting used to holding a pair of binoculars. Once they've got that down pat, we then introduce field guides. And as you can imagine, for a learner who really doesn't know very much, um, a, holding a field guide is very, very <laughs> distracting and, and they really don't know what to do. So we sit down and we explain how to use a field guide um, and how to identify a bird and what features to really look at. On the bottom, Right, or bottom left, sorry, you can see another poster, again, using picture of local birds, always starting at the local, the known, and working out to the unknown. This, the learners are given a variety of pictures and they need to identify the bird. And then we narrow it down to at least 12 birds, which moves us on to the next picture. Have you seen these birds lately? which we then put up at the school grounds or in their community hall. And these learners need to focus on and look for these birds and keep records for at least a week. Those learners who have the availability of technology and particularly um, apps and, uh, or iPads or phones that can load the Bird Lasser app, we then encourage them to start logging these birds on the app as well. So you can see we really go from a small number of birds and get learners into the basic concepts um, and identification skills, and then we move them on to collecting data. What we have seen as time has gone by is that particularly with the data that's collected by BirdLasser on the BirdLasser app, is the mathematics teachers are now getting involved and asking for that data and using it within their lessons. So again, there's a very nice link that we're building, not only with technology and the use of apps and bird monitoring, but also being able to support the curriculum. There's always a competition when we have our junior club um, meetings as to who has seen the most number of birds during a week. As I said, bird identification and understanding birds is really important down to basics. So what we do is an activity called bird geography. So the left hand side is a puzzle of a bird made up of all its different parts. And the idea is for learners to put this bird together in the correct order um, and being able to understand and identify where the breast is, where a rump is, uh, event, etc. The two weaver pictures over here is just another example of learning the different parts of a bird. So we have a bird picture and cut out our arrows indicating the different parts of the bird and the learners are able to then um, correctly place these labels on the picture of the bird. So you can see two very similar activities but coming across in very different means. Junior treasure hunts, this is definitely for the younger children. Um, what we do is we try as much as possible when we develop resources that we use things that are easily and readily available around the home or even at school. So here we've used an egg box, 18 egg box, and we have attached on the front, you can see a treasure hunt list. 
little learners, younger learners love going around and, and collecting all these different items. What we do make sure though, when we put these lists together, is we have both natural and man-made items that the learners would need to collect. When they come back, having collected all these items, and there's always a, a flurry of, of children running around trying to collect these items, um, we're then able to sort them and separate into natural and man-made items, as well as what birds would need. Um, it, we could possibly have put seeds on the list, uh, nest building material, feathers, things like that. So we're able to sort out and find out with these junior juniors, the younger children, what is what is necessary for birds to be able to survive in a habitat and also what is destructive to their habitat. So items like pollution, strings, plastic, that sort of thing. Another exciting activity or two activities that we do use is Birdingo, it is a bit of a tongue twister. Um, this game is based on um, bingo, the normal bingo, however we're using birds. So on the top left, you can see this is our Birdingo sheet that we developed for the Spring Alive program. It is a sheet with all our migratory birds. And the idea is each group gets a different set out sheet. Um, and then you can use either learners who will come and draw a name out of a hat and learners firstly need to identify that bird, choose which is the correct one, and then be able to check it off their list. The aim of this game, like in bingo, is to find four birds in a line, either from left to right, uh, right to left, up or down, or even diagonally. So again, we're working on the concept of bird identification and recall of information learned previously. The bottom right is another activity linked to language and specifically in this case, spelling. So this is our wor word waddle. Um, and what happens here is you create a list of bird names, again, focusing on local birds. Um, and then make sets of colored letters for the learners. And the focus here is for learners not to read, not only to read what the bird's name is, but then to spell it out with the different le letters, very much similar to Scrabble. And it's a bit of really much a competition of who can finish their list of birds first. What teachers have said is that this game has really helped learners in terms of spelling um, and also their reading skills as well. Another, another set of activities, um, playing snap or bird memory games. Here we develop a list of birds commonly found in an area um, and make these flash cards, making sure that the back, as you can see, is blank. Um, you can either play it like you would normally play snap, so putting your cards down at, at different times and trying to find that pair, or you can play it in a memory game format where all the cards are placed down, face down, and learners then work in teams to try and figure out where those partner pairs are. This does create a lot of disruption and a lot of noise as everybody gets so excited but once they really focus down on uh, where, where different birds are being found in a set of cards, um, there's a lot of excitement. Not only are you using this in terms of memory and recall, but also identification of the species themselves. Another popular one with both children and adults alike is bird pictionary. Again, this works on communication skills um, as well as recall. So like you would normally pay, play Pictionary, you would have a list of bird names and then in your group select an artist and they would need to draw what that bird is or, or draw it out the name for, for the rest of the group. 
Um, it's always easier to use slightly easier things to draw. And I've just scribbled down some, some different birds that we commonly use. Um, the most interesting one is always the dark cat bulbul. You can only but imagine some of the drawings that come out of this one. But again, learners, are, the children are working with bird names and becoming familiar with them. And quite often after we've drawn our, our different species, we then show the learners what they actually look like. And the recall has been absolutely amazing. So setting themes for the year, and this is the, the section that um, we've really looked a lot at, and in particular when you start working with other organizations. As I mentioned, the Clay Edu Center, we do partner with um, a local organization called the Little Lions, and when we go into the school or into the aftercare, we really go in as, as a team. Um, so, but all our activities support the other. Uh, for instance, you can see in term one, we selected the theme of water and really started looking at the importance of water in our natural habitats and all the hohos and nunus that live in the water and, and make and clean out the water, filter the water, um, as well as provide um, prey and food for a lot of the birds and other organisms living in the area. We also combine other programs and projects into our Junior Bird Club. For instance, the Mini SAS. And I'm sure many of you have heard of Mini SAS. It is a low level monitoring system that was developed for water, focusing on um, uh, organisms found or absent in the water, which would give you an indication of the quality of the water itself. Um, our Little Lions, our, our partner organization, do a lot of uh, movement and art drama, um, and they often present uh, different performances to our junior bird clubs. Just adds a sense of a different variety to our uh, programs as well. As I mentioned, we do try and mix up our activities and you can see how different things are. And we always try and end our term activities with an action taking. So here you can see at the end of term one with our theme of water, we did a waterway cleaner. And this was beginning of this year and before COVID hit us. And we were able to collect 45 black dustbin bags of litter from a waterway near to the Clay Edu Center. Again, you can just see it in term two, our focus was on plastic and how does plastic impact on our environment? We brought in short movie clips for the learners to watch. Many of them don't, aren't able to watch movies, especially in the more rural areas. Um, and we looked at the impact that the friendly floaties, which was, I think it was in 2009, when 29,000 floating ducks um, escaped from a container off a ship, um, and the impact that that had in the environment, and the learnings that happened from that. As I mentioned, bringing uh, guests in is always a good idea, well, most of the time is a good idea. So what we try to do with our junior bird clubs is link them to other projects happening in schools. So we had a primary school from just up the road that came in and actually did a workshop with our learners um, on how to make creatures out of plastic materials. Very, very exciting. And those plastic creatures were then um, entered into the Buckerstrom Art Ramble. Unfortunately, it didn't take place, but we still had a, a separate um, award ceremony for the participating learners. So here again, we make start giving recyclables or, or waste a value. One of the big things with junior bird clubs is recognizing the participation of the learners. And this can take various different formats. We're very lucky in Vakustrum that the local bird club, Vakustrum Bird Club, sponsors and assists us with supporting our junior bird clubs. 
And you can see on the left here, we've designed in collaboration with the learners, our own Bird, uh, Bird Club logo. Um, and actually had that printed on t-shirts. So every term we select four learners that become our helpers um, and they help with moving resources, organizing the um, other learners and in recognition of their assistance and support, they are each given the t-shirt. Um, so we change it up every term and bring in new learners. We also construct various um, certificates certificates of participation, um, as well as recognizing learners that really start contributing in terms of monitoring of birds in their area. Um, also those learners who are really trying hard, um, we would often give them an up and coming birder certificate. And I really find that these certificates encourage these learners um, in a small way to continue supporting the efforts and activities of our junior bird clubs and encourage them to keep coming back as well. Another activity or set of activities that we often make use of in our, in our junior bird clubs is the Spring Alive program. I'm sure many of you or some of you have heard about this program. It is international, an international education campaign which helps children and families become more familiar with nature. Simple mechanism enabling mostly children from Europe, Asia and Africa to track the arrival of our spring migrants with seven mascots. And how we do this is via our website where children and adults alike are able to register their first sightings of these spring migrants, which include, you can see in our logo there, the white stork, the common cuckoo, European bee eater, the, the common swift, barn swallow, uh, sand martin, and newly added for 2020 is the common ringed plover. So we're, what we really do across Europe, Asia and Africa is combined education, awareness and fun, as well as action taking in a very simple way. This year, our Spring Alive program is sponsored by Heidelberg Cement. Available resources which we make use of with our Spring Alive project, there are three story books that we have developed over the years. Um, one focusing on the white stork, another on the European bee eater, and one that took a very different format this year on the common ring plover we use the Kamishi by storytelling format. For those who aren't familiar with it, it is a Japanese art um, of storytelling where you have moving pictures that move through a screen um, or a stage. And this, we're hoping, really takes off soon. There's a variety of word search activities, always useful when there's rain outside and we can't go out and do hands-on activities. There's the 30 day, um, days of spring advent calendar. Um, each day is linked to a, um, a fact about spring or spring migration and leads you to further to a different activity. <clears throat> Pardon me. And chasing this and coming in this year, we've got the chasing migration board game which is absolutely exciting and we are actually launching it tomorrow evening with the Vakastrum Bird Club. So we hope that that takes off well. We also have a variety of other art sort of competitions or, or features. Um, and at the bottom second picture from the left, you can see those are our spring migrant masks that are available for download and use in, in our junior bird clubs as well. The theme for Spring Alive 2020 is how to be a good bird watcher. And we've got a couple of competitions running for the Spring Alive program, which are open to all South African children under the age of 16, with the closing date on the 15th of December. So what are these competitions and how do we use them? The first one is drawing a poster or, or, or picture of how to be a good birder. Um, and this is quite an interesting one um, and brings in the concepts of 
ethics and morals when out birding and presenting them in an art form. Our second competition that we'll be running this year, sponsored by the Vakastrum Bird Club, is a commission by a storytelling competition. So learners will be able to or need to research about the different mascots of the Spring Alive program and then create their own commission by story um, of one of these mascots, film it or record it and then submit it and could be eligible for a prize. As I said, these are open to all South African children under the age of 16 and a closing dates of the 15th of December. Now you're going to ask me, where do we send these entries? These would all be need to send, be sent to me by the 15th of December. Another set of activities that are very useful and, and fulfilling within this junior bird clubs is our bird of the year um, resources that are developed annually. This year focuses on the Southern Ground Hornbill and all these infographics, posters, lesson plans and coloring in templates, as well as stickers, which are very cute. And this is one of them, are, can be downloaded from our BirdLife website. So please do visit there and have a look, see what is available for everyone. So before I started preparing for this presentation, I sent notes or a questionnaire across the world with all our partner organizations and asked them what would they suggest or what are they um, implementing with their junior bird clubs. One of the big things that came out is there aren't too many junior bird clubs across the world or if they are the public is not aware of them and I think we really need to focus on this and in, in terms of not only developing and implementing uh, junior bird clubs across our country and if not further afield but also making sure that everybody is aware of what these youngsters are up to and what are they involved in. Junior bird clubs are not always part of the school there could be an extramural activity or even further afield um, with community groups um, coordinated both by NGOs or by teachers or volunteers at these different clubs. The activities really range from anything from experiencing uh, nature and birds and birding to outings to theory-based projects to you name it, there is such unlimited number of activities that these clubs are involved in. One thing is definitely for sure, these junior bird clubs are of a high value. They create a positive attitude between the learners and for the learners themselves. And we've definitely seen a behavioral change in these learners. As if we go back to one of my previous slides, going from the heart to the head to the hand. Um, these learners' knowledge base has also grown. They're understanding the natural world in a more practical way and being able to use that information in their classes as well. One of the downsides, however, is that we seriously need committed people to be involved with junior bird clubs. It does take a lot of time and energy, but it is def well worth it. There's limited interaction because of the time involved and obviously the resources available and the funds available for organizations, teachers and volunteers to be able to support these junior bird clubs. One thing we do need to bear in mind, lessons learned and where do we go from here? Don't be disappointed at the number of children who come and go in your junior bird club. There is always going to be this up and down of numbers but focus on those who are regular at your meetings and their participation as well. Give the children jobs to do. Not only do they feel important, but it also gives them a sense of responsibility and being able to answer for various things. Keep your activities fun. Um, and this is really comes from your engagement of, with the learners and also gauging their interest you would often find that a very theoretical and paper-orientated activity is 
applicable for a short time, but you can't do it at every single meeting. A mix of activities is definitely the way to go with junior bird clubs. Involve appropriate technology. If things aren't available, don't push it on the learners. Take, take your, your sighting from, from what learners are, are looking for. Keep your meetings regular. There's nothing worse than setting up a meeting and not arriving for it. The children are always disappointed. Um, I often meet up with some of the children in, in local stores and, and along streets and things like that. And they always say, oh, Chrissy, remember our meeting on Friday. They love these sort of interactions with you as well. And the biggest thing of all, I think, is to be flexible. Have that plan A, but plan B, C, D, and E in your back pocket as well. And yeah, I think that's a bit of a roundup of what junior bird clubs are about and how you can become involved or, or start initiating a bird club in your area as well. And I'm obviously available if anybody has any questions further on or would like further support in potentially starting up your own junior bird club. So thank you for your time. And I think we'll be open for questions. Melissa? Christy, thank you so, so much for that. I am absolutely amazed at what you've been able to showcase tonight. And I had absolutely no idea just how creative and incredible all of your activities were. I'm really wishing that I could uh, go back in and become a, a Junior Bird Club member. But um, thank you so much for, for sharing with us. I've learned a hell of a lot and I'm sure everyone else that joined us this evening has too. And um, before we dive into some questions, I see we've got a, a couple of questions starting to come through. Just to remind everybody that when they are exiting the webinar tonight, you're going to have a survey popping up in your uh, internet browser. Please feel free to spend two minutes answering that for us. And all of the questions will link to Christy's talk this evening. And then, of course, next week, we've got a former BirdLife South Africa colleague joining us, Dale Wright. He'll, he'll be telling us all about his life of adventure and his quests to conserve some of Africa's most threatened biodiversity. Dale's a fantastic presenter, and it's good to have him visiting with us on the webinar series to share some of these amazing tales from Madagascar, Tanzania, and the southern tip of Africa. So be sure to tune in with us next week. Now, as we move into the question session, you can type your questions into the Zoom Q&A box or onto the Facebook Live comment feed. So Christy, I'm gonna start you off with um, one from Eleanor Mary Cattle. And Eleanor is saying, would you recommend that someone has training and experience as a teacher before they try and contemplate getting a junior bird club up and running? Oh, gosh, we're not going into this gently, are we? <laughs> <laughs> um, Eleanor, it's, it's, sure, oh, where do we start with that? I would suggest any um, experience with children, not necessarily being an educator, a teacher, um, is ideal or, or the way to go. Um, I think it's any sort of experience. You can always call on assistance from teachers or environmental educators to assist you. So it's really where does your comfort level sit and, and, and what so, sort of support would you need to bring in? Um, so yeah, not necessarily, you don't have to be a qualified teacher, but an interest with children um, would be the ideal. Thanks, Christy, and I think that was a great, great answer to a challenging question. <laughs> now, <laughs> birding, birding is often described as a, a gateway to natural history. Have you found that many of your students have branched out beyond birds into other taxa, and have you sort of fostered this environmental enthusiasm in them? Most definitely, most definitely. I think one of the things that we, we, we really try and push with our junior bird clubs is yes, birds are our focus, but we definitely use them as vehicles to explore everything that is around us. Um, so they're really our guiding force into the other taxa um, and into basically everything, the natural world around us. Absolutely, yeah. We love using birds as indicator species in our conservation work, and they certainly are a great tool for getting everyone into environmental education. Now, we've got two questions linking to um, COVID-19 and how it's impacted on your activities this year. And I'm sure you've got many war stories to tell us. 
Um, so the first one is from Penny Abbott just asking how COVID has sort of affected your club. And then Russell Stevens is also asking, um, obviously before COVID, I'm sure you had all these plans lined up and how are you now dealing with hands-on education in COVID-19 times? You want the straight answer. <laughs> COVID has been horrible. Um, it's, it's definitely limited the interaction that we have had with our junior bird clubs. Um, so much so that schools and the aftercare programs are not allowing us in at this point. So it's been very much a, a distance education and, and interaction. Um, a lot of the sort of uh, theory side of things and the competition side of things, we've been able to print and drop off at schools, um, but we haven't had that interaction with, with the children. We have tried to take um, some of our Spring Alive activities virtual, um, but there again, we're limited by the number of children who have access um, to that technology as well. So <laughs> we've really had to think on our feet. That plan B, C, D, and E have definitely come into um, action there. Um, so we've done recordings of um, sessions, which we've then passed on to the teachers for them to show in their classrooms. Um, but it's, it's, it's definitely been a trying time. And I'm, yeah, I'm missing that interaction with all our kids. Um, they almost feel like my little, my little kids. Um, and I've missed them horribly during this time. So hopefully soon we'll be able to basically meet physically again. Um, if not in our large numbers, but definitely in smaller representative groups. Absolutely. Thanks, Christy. Yeah, and I, I know that you're missing that, that interaction. I certainly have been too with the, the few groups mm. of honorary ranger, junior rangers that I interact with. We had to do virtual club meets and it's definitely not the same as getting to interact hands-on with the kids. So well done mm, for pushing different. through and uh, hopefully we'll, <laughs> we'll all be able to hang out with each other in person sooner rather than later. Um, Aline Morrison wants to know how many junior bird clubs are there? So I suppose how many do you run? And then do you know of any others sort of in South Africa that are currently on the go? I know Claremont High School's got quite a, a well-established bird club. Are there any others that you know of? Um, okay, let's, let's go back a little bit. Okay, so at the moment we support three junior bird clubs in Mpumalanga South, so between Buckersham and Fortress. Um, there are, I think there are two that the Cape Bird Club supports. Uh, Priscilla will be able to answer that a little bit more in detail. And I see one of her comments ca has come up as well. I uh, guess you definitely need a champion teacher on staff or a champion volunteer to, to help you make these um, junior bird clubs a success. At this point, I don't know of many more uh, junior bird clubs that exist. But I think that's definitely an avenue that we need to explore and support going forward in terms of development and implementation. So there are sure. very few that exist. Yeah, and I, I think, as you said, without those sort of champion teachers, we know how busy mm. all of our teachers are. I try to get a bird club going at my old high school with a mate of mine, and it definitely just was overwhelming trying to, to keep the momentum going between the two of us being very, very busy anyway. But uh, having, having those teachers on the ground that can step in and just kind of keep that momentum going is super, super key. So great, great suggestion there from Priscilla. Um, thanks, Christy. And then Maggie Roper's tuned in. Hi, Maggie, to ask how does she access some of these resources? So she's part of Santon Bird Club and they do a couple of bird walks each year targeted specifically at young birders. Um, I had a, a great experience out with them near um, a birding sanctuary in Benoni on the east of Johannesburg. Um, and yeah, they're really doing some great work to try and get youngsters involved, but she says there's always room to do more. So in terms of trying to access all these activities, where would you suggest people go to try and bulk up what they're doing? Well, definitely drop me a line. Um, we've got a range of activities. These are just a couple of them um, that I showcased tonight, but there's uber loads of them. So please do give me a shout um, and we, we can chat about what sort of direction you want to take and what would be the more applicable activities or resources to use. 
Um, so yeah, give me a holler and let's see how we can assist you. Fantastic. Christy, I'm not seeing any other questions coming through, but I see we do have a comment from Tia who is tuning in all the way from Zagreb in Croatia. So it's wonderful to, to have some international listeners on here tonight. And I think if I can just say from my side how inspiring this talk has been and just seeing all of the amazing activities that are out there to try and get youngsters involved in birding. Um, I really hope that many, many people who haven't been able to join us tonight will go and watch your YouTube video and get inspired. And I hope that tonight, if anybody is thinking about reaching out and trying to encourage youth to get involved in birding through establishing their own bird club, that they will reach out to you and get, get involved in this amazing hobby of ours and growing the next generation of birders and conservationists. And I absolutely loved hearing your story of all the, the young minds that you touched back in the day that ultimately ended up going into the different science and teaching fields. It's, it's such a privilege to be able to inspire young minds. So well done to you. And please continue to keep doing the absolutely incredible work that you are doing, Christy. I don't know if you'd like to say any parting words before we close off tonight, but just from me, a big thank you so much for joining <laughs> us tonight. No problem. Thanks. Thanks, Melissa, for hosting. And I think maybe just in closing is, you know, we, we, we all can make a difference out there. And whether it's just planting that little seed of enthusiasm and interest, um, you never know where it's going to go. Um, and quite often, you know, we say, you know, if one child walks away remembering one thing from, an, from a meeting or an interaction, the job is done. Um, so I think I'd like to also thank BirdLife for the opportunity for letting me run loose with, with this <laughs> Junior Bird Clubs program. <laughs> um, and and interest interacting with students from different fields and different areas and everything else. So thank you to everybody who makes it possible. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Christy, and thanks to everybody who stayed tuned this evening and joined us. We'll look forward to speaking to all of you again next week, Tuesday, with Dale Wright's upcoming talk. So thanks so much, Christy, and thanks to everyone else. Keep your eyes on the skies and keep enjoying those birds, and I will speak to you all next week. Have a good evening, everybody.